Hey everybody, today I'm going to be showing you my workflow and kind of a tutorial for uh, LRGB images of open and globular clusters in Pixinsight. Uh, I'll throw some information up on the screen right now about uh, when you can skip ahead to different parts of this processing workflow. All right. So this is an image of Messier number five. This is actually four images because this was taken through four different uh, filters with the mon monochrome camera. I'll throw the specs of the uh, images up on the screen right now with the gear and the exposure time. So one of the things that I always like to double check before starting processing in Pixinsight is if I have flux enabled because it tints your monitor to be slightly orange and it's easier on your eyes at night, but it's not color accurate at all. So we're gonna start processing with our luminance image here. Uh, I'm going to assume that you've already are able to calibrate and register and stack images. If not, I'm going to have a link to the Light Vortex Astronomy tutorial in the description. It is pretty much the standard in terms of pre-processing and Pixinsight. So if you don't have your stacked images yet, uh, read through the entire article. It's a bit long, but it is incredibly valuable information. So now that we have our stacked images and we've named them appropriately so we don't get them mixed up, first process we're going to get to is dynamic crop, because as you can see along the edges here, we have some areas of low to no signal just from the artifacts involved with stack. We're going to load up our dynamic crop process and click the reset button. Now we get this gray box over our image and we can just drag in the corners to our liking. I usually don't go too far in, uh, just enough so that we're not getting any of this black in our final image. And also, if we unstretch this image, we can better center the center dot on like the center of the cluster. Then restretch it here. This is the screen transfer function stretch. We can see we're not gonna have any of that black stuff on the edges. Now, before we click the big green check mark, one thing that we're going to want to do is click and drag the little triangle icon down here. And that way we can save this dynamic crop process and apply it to all the other images. So let's go ahead and apply it to the luminance. And now we can just click and drag the crop process. And our red has the exact same crop, it's the exact same resolution. Uh, just for the tutorial purposes, I've already made a dynamic crop process here. So we'll just undo this real quick and reapply the crop. I'd also like to point out that these images um, were star aligned all to the same luminance reference frame before stacking. So as you can see here, if we overlay the images, everything is perfectly star aligned. So let's go ahead and apply the crop to our green image and the blue. Now the next step is background extraction. If you're lazy, you can just do an automatic background extraction. Uh, however, I typically do a dynamic background extraction. It's a bit more accurate than just the regular old automatic background extraction. So we will open up the dynamic background extraction process and click reset. And now I got this cross on our image. Let's start things off by setting the tolerance to one. Sample radius to 15, samples per row to 8, and we can click Generate. Now it's generated a bunch of sample points. Now, your images will likely have some sort of gradient already, and as you can see here, because we had a low tolerance of 1, it didn't generate any sample points in the top part of the image just because it's so much brighter than the rest of the image. What we can do to fix this is set the tolerance to 1.5 and then click generate again. And now it's generated more sample points. And then from here, I usually just like to go back to one and then click the resize 
button. It won't delete any of these points it generated, which is a good thing. Also, since we're working in monochrome images, uh, it's a bit easier if we change the sample color to something like blue here, just so they're easier to distinguish from the gray background. Now this is the part where it gets tedious. Zoom in one-to-one -one on your image. We'll just scroll up to the top here and expand it out. And we gotta make sure that there aren't any stars in any of these sample points here, and so that we're only sampling the background. How DVE works is it'll use this sample point and just say, hey, this is the background for this part of the image, so it'll subtract it. And if there are any stars in your sample point, like this, it'll think that star is part of the background and it will try to subtract something that you shouldn't. It just really fucks up your images. But I'll just go through and check these sample points one at a time. Make sure that they're not on any stars like this. And I always make sure that they're not on diffraction spikes or any uh, faint little galaxies or any nebulosity, any structure. This is also a really great way to find those faint, tiny little background galaxies in your images. And also, you get a good understanding of any aberrations in your imaging setup. If you have star trailing, or if you're out of focus, or if your collimation was off, or if you've got coma that you need to correct, Zooming in at your image at a one-to-one -one scale like this and really getting a good look at all these stars is a great way to figure out any problems that you might have in your setup and then you can fix them the next time you go out an image. So I'm just going to skip around here because I've already made a DBE process for this image just for the sake of time. You can see we're not going to attempt to put a DBE point here just because even though if it followed the grid exactly, there would be one there. It's right in the middle of our cluster. And also, if you have a DBE point that's kind of in a dense star field and you don't want to shift it around too much, just hit the delete key. One of the benefits of having this many DBE points is that, uh, you know, it's okay if you toss out a bad one if there's nowhere to put it in that air region of the image. You also don't want to move them too far so you have two on top of them like this. Uh, there's really no point necessary in doing that. So I'm going to X out of this because I've already made a process. Uh, to make this process, you just drag the triangle icon out again, and then you can double click it and it'll have all the points saved. And I've gone ahead and checked all these, made sure that there are no stars in any of these points. And one thing that you want to do before uh, you click the check mark is to set the correction to subtraction. And then I always set it to replace target image. So once you've done that, you can make your process icon, click the check mark, and it'll subtract the background. So this here is our background model that it generated. As you can see, it's a little brighter at the top and then kind of dark at the bottom. These images have been corrected with flats, but there's still a bit of a gradient. We can get rid of this background and then reapply the STF to the luminance image. I'm going to duplicate this just to show you comparison of before and after DBE. And it's really helped out with the gradients a lot. It's just a lot flatter, smoother image. And usually what I like to do is I like to run DBE twice on my images just to get rid of any gradients that didn't pick up in the first go. So if we restretch this new background, you can see there's still a little bit of a gradient. Not sure how well this will show up on YouTube with this before and after. So anyways, 
we can now apply the DVE to the rest of our images, the RGB images. So just double click the icon, click the check mark. And I always just double check the background. And let's do it one more time. All right, I'll apply the DBE to the rest of the images and get back to you. All right, so this part of the tutorial is now gonna cover the RGB processing. So go ahead and open up our red, green, and blue images. They've already had the dynamic background extraction applied to them, so the next step is linear fits. The linear fit tool, I always select the green frame and apply it to the red and blue frames. What the linear fit does is it brings the brightness level of whatever image you apply it to, to the same brightness as the reference image. And typically green tends to be the highest uh, average brightness. Uh, just it's how it usually works out for some reason. Uh, I want to say it's air glow or light pollution or something, but I've always found it works best on green. I would recommend tinkering around with it if it's your first time, but I think for probably 99% of my images, it's always green. And you can leave the rejection settings at the default. So we will uh, give these a stretch. And now you can get rid of this. Now we go to the channel combination. I'll just reset that real quick. Make sure our color space is in RGB. And we will, no, that's not it. We want red, green, and blue. And then we'll hit apply global. So if we give this a stretch, now we can see our RGB image. And even with the linear fits, the image is still horribly green if we give it a regular stretch. I'll just close these out real quick. That's because we are doing a linked stretch and not an unlinked stretch. If we open up the screen transfer function process, you see a little chain icon in the top. We click that and then re-click the nuke button. You can see it stretches each of the RGB channels separately as opposed to stretching them all the same. And we get better color balance, but it's still fairly green overall. We'll go ahead and rename this M5 underscore RGB, just so we don't get it confused. And the next step is photometric color calibration. Uh, this is typically what I use, and I'll reset it real quick. Uh, photometric color calibration, it tends to be a, a little bit better than the normal background neutralization and color calibration processes. However, sometimes this just flat out refuses to work and I have to go back to regular color calibration. So we'll search coordinates. I already typed in M5 here. So search, get it. Uh, basically how this works is it'll plate solve the image, find out its coordinates, and then figure out the color based off of that. I always just leave the white reference as the average spiral galaxy. That seems to do well. Observation dates, uh, really you just need the year and maybe the month to be correct. You don't need it to be accurate to the day and the second. Focal length, this is at 610 millimeters and the ASI 1600 has 3.8 micron pixels. Do keep in mind, you'll have to adjust your focal length if you run a drizzle. So if I ran a 2x drizzle, then my focal length would be 1220. And for the background neutralization, we will check this. And let's just zoom in and hover over some part of the background and some different background values. And pay attention to the three brightness values at the bottom of the screen. I'll circle them or whatever in post. 
and we'll hover over some faint teeny stars and just see what we're looking at. Okay, point zero zero eight eight. That's what we're looking at. Zero zero nine three. So we'll just set this to 0 0.01. It'll neutralize anything dimmer than that, basically. And we can click and drag our icon over and let it run. All right, so photometric color calibration finished. We have this nice graph. I have no idea what the fuck it means, but we don't have to worry about that. So our image is kind of pinkish right now. We'll just close out this. And we just have to reapply the screen transfer function. However, now we can link the RGB channels and stretch them all equally. And you can see now we have a nicer image. But it's still a little bit green overall. So I typically run the SCNR process after photometric color calibration. Uh, Probably, let's start off with 33 for the amount. So it'll blend 0.3 of the output image with 0.66 of the original image. If we undo this, you can see if we do it at an amount of 1, it, it's just kind of too magenta-y. So we'll undo that. 0.3 seems to work good. Uh, with SCNR, it's really dependent on uh, the image itself. So I would play around with it and see what looks good for you. And overall, I'm happy with this amount. It's around 0.3 for this image in particular. Just reapply the stretch and make sure nothing happens. Okay, good. So this next step is pretty much well, what will make your stars look super nice in your stars only images and that is HSV repair. It's not a process, it's under scripts, utilities, and repaired HSV separation. I can't talk right now. Uh, here we have, it's already selected the output images. Uh, max repair radius, uh, you basically want to set that value to whatever the maximum radius of your largest stars are. Um, I just leave it at 16 most of the time and that's fine. And your repair level, that's gonna be dependent on uh, your stars themselves. So I'll close out this real quick. And let's take the stretch off. And let's zoom in to a star that's pretty saturated. How HSV repair works is it looks at this ring of unsaturation around the star, and determines the color, and then fills in this white space in the middle with that color. Uh, so we're just going to look at some of the pixel values here around the edge. And you want to look for whatever the lowest one is. So right around in here, 0.35, 0.25. I don't think you have to be too precise, 0.2. But you want to look for whatever the lowest one is. In this case, it's in the blue channel. But as you saw earlier uh, in the script, I ended up choosing 0.2. So we'll just do that for this image. Again, uh, for best results, it's a good thing to play around with your image. And we'll hit OK and let this run. Yeah, just playing around with the settings and seeing works best. Trial and error is really the best approach to learning PixInsight. Okay, we can minimize this RGB image for now. And we have H, S, V, V, and then unrepaired V. So now what we do is go back to channel combination, hit resets, and go to the HSV color space. And this should 
just automatically have the thing pop up. Right, we'll once you use HSV and then unrepaired V instead of just normal V. And then we can click apply global. All right, there's our image. We'll just rename this M5. And we can minimize all these just so they're not cluttering up the workspace. So let's compare this to before the HSV repair. Now these images look pretty much identical, but the real difference, uh, you can see if we unstretch these images, and let's zoom back in on the uh, that red star we were looking at earlier. So you can see, if we zoom in, the original image, the core is saturated. There's no color data there. However, now, after the HSV repair, there's color in it. And that's what really makes your stars look good in stars-only images like this. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell with this. I don't think that one was fully saturated. If we look at some other stars here, around uh, this section. Yeah, definitely this one here. Nice and white in the middle. And then here, it's nice and blue. And the same thing goes for this big star up here. Although I think, just because it's a close binary, it might not have worked as well with these two different star colors. If you stretch the images, they look pretty good. So now that we have our HSV repaired image, we can minimize it and move on to the luminance. So onto the luminance processing. Uh, there's really only two things that I do to this, and they're both noise reduction techniques. Uh, I follow along the John Riesta linear noise reduction tutorial. Uh, it is pretty much the best noise reduction tutorial out there, I've found. And it's what we're going to be using today. I'll have a link to the full article in the description below if you want to take a look at it. So let's take our luminance and we will duplicate this. We'll name this lum underscore L. This first step that we're doing is making the masks for the noise reduction. So we'll load up histogram transformation preset it because there's already something there. And what we're going to do is apply the screen transfer function. So we'll hit the nuke icon and then drag the triangle to the bottom bar of the histogram transformation. Because as you may remember, screen transfer function is just a preview of the data. However, this will permanently stretch it. So, you know, we can click this all we want. This is what the actual image looks like now. So from here, we will duplicate this image twice. We will rename this one to lum underscore tvg and this one to mmt because the John Reese tutorial calls for tvg and mmt noise reduction. Now we'll do a curves transformation on this. Reset this from earlier. Basically, we're going to bring the left, the very bottom left corner, this point right here on the curve, up to just below this line. And then the one on the right, bring it to just above this line here. And then apply it. This makes a very low contrast image. We can close that up curves and then go back to histogram transformation and select our TVG image and reset the histogram transformation. Basically, we're going to adjust this middle slider here until the peak of the image is right at this 50% line in the middle. So we'll go ahead and do that. It doesn't have to be exact unless you do want to tweak around with it. 
get varying degrees of noise reduction, and then we'll apply it to our image. So this is our TVG mask. We'll go ahead and minimize that and the uh, L image. And then for the mask for multi-scale median transform, we'll go ahead and reset this and look at the MMT histogram. And we'll just drag the middle slider until the peak is between 75 and 80%, so around this region here. Let's go ahead and do that. And that's probably good enough. And we can close that histogram transformation, minimize our mask. I'll bring these over here. So we can take our TVG mask and then click and drag this part onto the gray part of our luminance image. And now the mask is applied. Let's actually show it. Now, right now, the stars are white and the background is red. So that means if we did our noise reduction right now, it would apply the noise reduction to our stars. We don't want that, so we're going to invert the mask. It's kind of a subtle difference, especially with this low contrast mask, but you can tell that it's going to affect the background more than the stars now. And we can hide the mask. This part is still orange here, so we know the mask is still applied. And I will make a preview here. So we'll click this uh, new preview icon. And we'll just drag it so we get a bit of the cluster itself and then a bit of the background. And this is what we'll use as our, uh, I guess, testing ground. Because obviously if we applied the noise reduction to the entire image, that would take forever. So we'll just apply it to the preview. And you can make multiple previews and test out different noise reduction settings. You can make one on just a cluster. You could make one on like a bright star. You can make one on, you know, just background, really anything, and test out different settings. So I'll go to process, TVG denoise. I'll reset this real quick. And first thing we'll want to do is turn the edge production down to negative five over here. And we'll turn on local support. And our support image is going to be that L image that we made earlier. So now let's see what this does at just the default settings. All right, you reduce the noise. Uh, you can toggle, if you're looking at a preview, you can toggle back and forth using Control Shift Z to see what effects the noise reduction has. This is maybe a little bit too strong. How about if we clone the preview and then if we turn the edge protection down. Let's try 1.5, see what that looks like. And let's zoom in, make sure that we're looking at the same region here. I don't know how well this is going to show up with the YouTube compression, but this is a little bit less noise reduction. It's not making things too smooth, but just for the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to leave it at that. Again, I highly recommend playing around with different settings, different iterations, um, especially different iterations, maybe some different strength values and just seeing what works best for you. So we'll apply the TPG denoise.
All right, the TVG has been applied to the whole image now. If we go back, you can see it did a nice job. You can close this out. And one thing you can do after you've applied the noise reduction is reapply the STF because now it's going to do a little bit more aggressive of a stretch. So this is with the old STF before noise reduction. And then after it stretches it a bit more because there's less noise, you can see if we go back to the original image with the same STF, it's a lot more noise than before. So next we're going to do a multi-scale median transform. So we'll take our MMT mask and apply it to the luminance. Yeah, we can see all our stars are white, so we'll invert it. And now it looks like the whole image is red, but if we zoom in, we can see these little pockets of black that are going to be affected. And that's really what MMT is for. We can go back to our preview now. Open up multi-scale median transform. Uh, this will be blank when you first start off, but just click the noise reduction box. And then I just use the default settings recommended by the John Risa tutorial. Uh, 10, 10, 7, 5, 5, 2.5, 2, 2 for the noise reduction thresholds. And then set the target to luminance. And that works well for pretty much all of my images. But again, it'd be good if you played around with the settings to figure out what worked best. So let's apply it to our preview. And we'll use Control Shift C. Yeah, it really helped reduce a lot of that noise, especially that larger scale kind of dark noise. Let's restretch this, just the preview itself with the noise reduction applied, then compare it to before. Yeah. All right, this is good enough for tutorial purposes. Again, you can play around with some of these settings uh, if you wish. And now we've applied MMT to our entire image. And let's just give it one last stretch before, or I guess after noise reduction. And yeah, the image is a lot smoother. Let's go back two steps and see just how noisy this background is before and after the noise reduction. All right, now on to the next step. So now we're at the end of our linear processing and we can begin the stretch to nonlinear. Uh, here we have the luminance in the RGB images and these both have the auto stretch applied. However, this is just a temporary preview. And this is what the images actually look like right now if we were to save them. Uh, so we'll start with the stretched nonlinear on the RGB image. It's a two-step process that I do, starting with the arcsine H stretch. Let's reset that and open up the real-time preview. And we'll click Estimate Black Point. Now, all of these little blips and pixels on here, those are pixels that are being clipped to black, so clipped to zero basically. We don't want that, so we're going to take this black point slider, this is the fine adjustment one, also you can do a coarse adjustment, but that's a little too coarse, so we'll redo that. And drag this down a bunch, just so we're not clipping any black pixels at all even though it may not look like there's any being clipped right now. When we do the histogram transformation, you'll be able to look at the histogram and see. 
So now we'll take the stretch factor and we'll actually stretch it a bit. And the arcsine H stretch is a good way of preserving colors. You know, especially all the wonderfully colored stars that we got from the HSV repair. And one thing we can do even better to preserve the colors is click the protect highlights. Overall, it'll dim the image a bit, but it won't clip any values. So we'll keep the colors, you know, actually there. And we'll do, let's do maybe 0.48. And we'll just save this real quick. I did do a stretch earlier. Uh, after doing some fine tuning. So we'll look at those values. Yeah, pretty much the same. We'll go with the old one that I made earlier, just so you don't have to see me fumble around with all of the settings for a bit. Uh, it really comes down to your own subjective tastes. So now we will apply that to our RGB image. And we will also apply the same arc sine H stretch to our luminance. So now we have two partially stretched images. But we're going to stretch them even further with histogram transformation. I'll reset this and load up our actual histogram. Now, if we didn't do, if we didn't uh, set the black point low enough in arc sine H stretch, this histogram peak would be shifted over and we would actually be clipping some data on this RGB image. However, the peak is far enough away that we don't have to worry about too much data being clipped. Although there is some clipping, it's not too big of a deal. We'll just take this middle slider. Actually, let's turn on the preview first. That'd probably be a good idea. Take the middle slider. I like to bring uh, the peak to around this dashed line here going vertical. That's probably good enough. And we'll apply that. Again, this image doesn't have to look great in terms of the contrast. It's This is mostly just for the color, whereas the luminance is where all the details are. So now we will reset that. Look at our luminance image, and we can see it's a lot sharper of a peak. So we can bring the black point down a bit. And we want to be careful not to stretch it too much that we're blowing out the stars in the core. At the same time, you know, making it look nice. That's probably good enough for now. We can adjust this a little bit later. But you can see the peak is also pretty close to this dashed line here. We want to get those fairly close to each other, but it doesn't have to be completely exact. Okay, so now we have our two nonlinear images. And now we get to actually combine our luminance and RGB data. For that, we're going to use LRGB combination. Let's reset this. We're going to uncheck the RGB. And the luminance, we're going to select our stretch luminance image. Another thing we can do is turn the saturation slider. Uh, basically, the lower the value, the more saturated the image will be. And the higher the value, the less saturated it will be. And if you leave it at 0.5, it won't adjust the saturation. I usually like to bring it to the 0.3 range, but it will probably be vary depending on your data. And let's go ahead and apply this. And 
All right, and that's a nice looking image right there. We got some nice saturated stars with some color. And we got all the details from the luminance. Let's do a before and after. Now we're actually going to go back a step because one thing that we can do is tick the chrominance noise reduction box. These default values of four and two are pretty good. Uh, sometimes I'll bump it up to five and two if it doesn't seem to correct some of the large scale chrominance noise. But if we zoom in, we can see there's all this color noise here which we can get rid of. However, I always do a preview with the saturation settings beforehand, like what we've done here, just because the chrominance noise reduction, it takes a while, and there's no point sitting around all that time waiting just to undo it. So we'll undo that, and I'll apply our LRGB combination with the chrominance noise reduction. Okay, so now we got our chrominance noise reduction in. We can see there's none of that color noise left in the background. Our stars are still saturated. You can play around with the saturation settings to your liking. All right, we are now on the final stage of processing. Uh, now that we've actually stretched and combined our luminance with our RGB and let's Rename this LRGB, and we don't need this. So now we're on to the nonlinear processing. Uh, from here, it really gets subjective, and it's really down to your personal tastes and how you want to handle it. Uh, you could run ACDNR if you want to do further noise reduction. I typically don't on just my stars only images. Uh, but one of the things I do a lot are curves adjustments. And that's pretty much all I do for my nonlinear processing. So we'll take a look at that. Let's start things off with a very slight S curve. Again, you can fiddle around with this uh, however you want. We can use this little button up here on the top of the preview to toggle back and forth. Yeah, it gets us some nice contrast. And let's uh, boost the saturation a bit. Maybe less so in the background. All right, let's see what this looks like. And that's pretty good. Another thing we can do is a range mask to help out with our curves. So we'll go to the range selection process, reset it. And this way we can mask out just our stars and our star cluster. I've noticed the, uh, was it star mask script and the advanced star mask scripts, uh, they tend not to include clusters or dense clusters like this. They'll just get the normal stars in the background. And I increase the smoothness and the fuzziness just so the mask isn't as sharp in its cutoff. So you can see now we're just going to work only on the stars and we can crank the saturation up a bit. It really comes down to your personal taste, and there's 
a million different things you could do. Make it a little bit brighter. Let's apply that. Reset the curves. And let's invert the mask so now we're only working on the background. We can turn that saturation down. We can also make it a little bit darker. This is just how I personally like my images. Get a nice dark but not black background and some very colorful stars. We zoom in on that cluster. It's nice and colorful. We got some rainbow spikes coming off of this star. This one over here, nice and red and saturated in the core. And yeah, you could leave it at that. I do want to try one thing. And I don't typically do this on my stars only images. Uh, but we'll use this ADV star mask script. It automatically makes a star mask. Uh, we can try reducing the star sizes just a little bit. Uh, it can be a little bit bloated if your tracking is off or if the seeing was bad on your particular night that you imaged. Then we'll apply this mask. So we're only affecting the stars. And of course, you saw the mask, it won't affect a lot of the stars in the core just because it's so dense, but it will affect a lot of these background stars. We'll go to morphological transformation and set it to erosion. We'll do size five. Make a rough outline of a star like this. You just want four black boxes in the corners like so. We'll turn the amount, let's try 0.5 for the amount. Yeah, it reduced the star sizes a lot. If we zoom in and undo it. I don't know if it's just me, it kind of makes it look more crisp. Like we actually did deconvolution or something, which I don't do on stars only images. But yeah, the, you can do whatever the hell you want. It's really subjective what you do with your images. But I think we are going to leave this one like so. And at this point, I would save it as an EXIF file. I always make two saves with my images. One is an EXIF file, and then another one with an annotation, and we'll save that as a PNG. Uh, I call this my anti-freebooting measure. If my images get stolen elsewhere, if I post them online, well, at least I'll have credit in the corner of the image. And another thing you can do, I like doing this particularly with globular clusters that don't have that much interesting stuff around them, we can do a dynamic crop as our last step. And just crop right into the cluster. Let's do 1600 by 1600. See, now we could post a final image like that, and it's just this dense star cluster in the middle, and you know people don't have to zoom in to actually look at it, and we can annotate from there. But yeah, that is uh, my workflow for processing LRGB images of open and globular clusters. I hope you enjoyed it. If you uh, have any feedback for my processing videos or any future suggestions for videos, please let me know in the comments below. Have a good one. Clear skies.